Welcome, a listener, to another episode of Spam, Spam, Spam Humbug. This is episode 140 of the podcast, and it is just a wild ride of an episode, if I do say so myself. I'm not in it. It actually begins with Draxneth and Golem Dragon discussing trials of mana and, uh, you know, discussing things like uh, ports of Japanese games coming over to the West and whether game plots could ever be as good as the plots of novels. And then Dr. Cat joins. And if you've heard our previous episodes, which feature Dr. Cat, you know that it, I mean, we're already a topical smorgasbord. We really, really are. But Dr. Cat is on a whole nother level, and the discussion just goes in every which way from there. They talk about the Final Fantasy series. They talk a lot about Dr. Cat's games and his career as a game designer, <clears throat> mentioning Furcadia, Runes of Virtue. Talk about some of the games that he's enjoyed playing. They talk about fun in video games and, you know, creating, balancing the challenge of a game so that it isn't too easy for players and also isn't so hard that it's off-putting and, you know, just maintaining that fun zone in, uh, in, in, the, in the middle and how things like in-app purchases and freemium models can upset that and actually exploit the upset of a good challenge loop in order to drive sales. And then as if that weren't enough, they also wind up talking about things like amusement parks and Game Pass and Google and Stadia and developing like pulse uh, pulse modulated sound effects for, you know, old, old video games and old games and computer systems. Even talks about selling a meow sound effect to uh, John Romero. Like I say, topical smorgasbord. And this is actually the first part of at least a two-parter, maybe even a three-parter, because you know what? I didn't even get a chance to join in the discussion to this point in the recording. And the recording went on for another five-ish hours afterward. So an immense amount of content. This is really only the first taste. Um, but it's a just it's a good little sort of pocket discussion about a whole bunch of really neat stuff course uh spam 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 humbug is now hosted on anchor.fm newer more social podcast hosting platform you can find us at anchor.fm slash sssh podcast if that is you aren't keen to visit us at spam 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 humbug.com if you do listen to us in the anchor app do consider liking us individual episodes or the entire podcast and please do share with your social media circles and as always, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by our Patreon backers, patreon.com slash Ultima Codex, if you would like to join the ranks thereof. Thank you to everyone who supports the podcast and the Codex by that means, and especially a hearty thank you to our co-producers, Seth, Golden Flame, Chris, Dominic, Violation, Cranberry, Christopher, Bruce, Dark Earth Dragon, Helgriff, Gronk, Pascal, and Thor1. And I am reminded that we actually have a little note of thanks to offer, because Riley Perry became a patron of ours a little while ago, kind of earlier on in May, and I missed giving credit when uh, I should have. Actually, I think this happened like the day after I released an episode. So, Riley, I apologize for not getting to this sooner, but thank you for backing the podcast. Um, and again, you know, uh, that helps make the podcast and the Ultima Codex continue to be a reality. And the rest of you listeners, I do invite you to hit up patreon.com slash Ultima Codex consider supporting us there as well. All right, enough for me. Let's get on with the show. I guess I shouldn't be too surprised that you've already reached that level that quickly in that game. Yeah, you probably have more time that you can spend on it than me. Yeah, yeah I'm already on post game. I already beat the game and. The I'm just gonna claim I'm savoring it. it. Right before. <laughs> the save game generated for the post game is right before you beat the game. And it opens up a new quest, for, which is the one that gives you the fourth class. No, the fourth class is for all of them. In all honesty, the game plays really well. So for Trials of Mana, I definitely give it a win at the moment. Let's see. And the Level fact that we got, what was it? we got what collection of mana for like oh, is it eleven bucks for the other games? On top of it, with the big discount they gave you is not too shabby. Mm -hmm. Actually, felt like money well spent. Mm -hmm. Although, from what it I tend to be see. a little 
how should I put it? A little suspect buying any game fresh at release. Mm. Mm. But mm. as I was saying, the fourth class is a uh, uh, post game quest. Actually, when you are directed to Balsena's library, and a magical book talks to you and tells you about a witch who is awakening in the world and who is a huge threat and the only way to defeat her is to attain the is to attain the fourth class and so that's how it begins i have to ask just because i'm curious what was your main one that you chose and the two other side ones you chose my main one was liz riz uh, the second one, Kevin, and third one, Angela. Interesting. I chose Angela as the primary one for me, and then I chose Duran, and then I chose Reese. Uh, for Reese, sure. I went. I went dark, dark. For Kevin, I went light, light, and also for Angela, light, light. Uh, Angela for the light, light class has a. Uh, a uh, special class feature where she recovers 15% of her maximum magic points after each battle. And she that also one. has she also has a skill that reduces the mana cons consumption by 30%. And there's another one that has a I think it's a 30% chance to spend zero magic points. And so if I I equip all those, and I set Angela to to use magic without concerning about her magic points, and she is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I figured with me her own description that she would be like you know, a little bit slightly overpowered magic user. And I'm like, well, let's mm -hmm. just pick her as primary because it would be fun. I went dark with her actually for the first one. Mm -hmm. And then Duran, I went dark. And then Reese, I actually went light. So I did the complete opposite of you. And which one did you choose? Reese, Angela, and Duran? Yep. Mm -hmm. Angela and um, Duran are going to go dark. Reese is going to go light for the, like, the... I think I'm going to go for the dragon summon. Mm -hmm. Just for uh, giggles. Well, uh, um, uh, after the post-end game, you can respect... There's there's an item that allows you to respec. You can try a different path. I hope they would have something like that. I kind of figured based on who made it, they would probably do that. But I don't like to always assume because some devs like to, I don't know, surprise us, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's good that they did do that. They followed through on my expectations, but that's a nice surprise. I didn't really could use a good surprise with the game, so... Charlotte kind of annoyed me with her voice actor, though. <laughs> the English one? The baby talk. <laughs> the baby talk? No, just no. <laughs> just no. It's, it irks me so much. Yeah, let me show so you. I'm never going to use that character ever. Hawking might be fun yeah. to do in another playthrough. Yeah. This I haven't is a met clip Kevin of yet. Angela. Angela's is a little annoying at times. But it's tolerable. Duran's good. Reese has a good one. Yeah, I switched to the Japanese voice acting. I should do that, just to see what it sounds like. Yeah, it actually sounds pretty good. Oh, by the way, check the clip I posted. Angela does a double spell and then follows up, follows up with the area fireball. I forgot that you streamed. I really should follow your stream. Here, we'll just do that now. <laughs> If you, if you check Angela's MP, it goes yeah, down to 142 and then jumps back to 161. The game's surprisingly fun. I was quite pleased with the uh, success of it. I'm quite happy to see it being very popular, too, with a lot of people as of late. It's one of those things where it's like, you know what? We need to see that be a growing one. Yeah, well, it's a game that was never originally released on, on the West, and they did it as a remake, which makes the game better than it originally was. Like, it's and it, literally a complete success, in my opinion, just with how enjoyable yeah. it is. 
I like being able to say that. I wish more games that had a fun, eventual release in the West would have that kind of success. Like, I'm still disappointed that we never got um, the dot hack sign MMO in the West. Which I still think that would have been a big success. But oh well. Mm. Uh, this one, the music, it's very close to the original, and it sounds really good. Yeah, I wouldn't say the story's, like, amazing or anything, but it's at least solid enough so far. There, It's like, okay, I can buy yeah, into I, it. Yeah, it was uh, it's something that is, I always find funny in regards to role-playing games, mostly in role-playing games. And there are lots of video game fans or fans of some franchise and they always say, oh, this game is the plot, the story is as great as the book, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it always makes me laugh, because that's not true. The, the plot from games, plots from RPGs, are never going to be as good as the plot from a book, because... Role playing because games in general they need to provide some sort of player agency. Either you narrate or you offer something to play. And normally the the if uh, if we compare a book with a with a game, the game is more like a movie. The game has a very narrow, very very small amount of narrative. The game is mostly visual. The game is about visual if a combination of narrative and visual effects, but it's mostly visual. And some of some what is called closure, which is a feature of the comic books, in which you you give something, you show something, and leave part of it to the player's imagination. And that's how you build stories with a game. That's how you narrate. If you if you compare it to the book, it's uh, like saying uh, if we were about to compare them as uh, levels in education, it's like comparing elementary school to a PhD. The well, book I think is for a lot of those, superior. I think for a lot of those people, they basically. The game executed upon what their sort of vision was with the book. And that's why they get to that extent of going, it's so good. Because there's a lot of movies, games, TV shows where it's like, okay, the book's amazing. And then you never know which route, whether good or bad, matching or not, your vision is for it when you finally see the, the more interactive or the more visual version of it. It's, it. It adds to some of the hilarity, I think. Yeah. As I say, they there are games which have nothing to do with books, and these guys these guys say the game plot, the game story, and everything is is up to the level of some of the greatest books ever written. <laughs> they haven't read a lot of books, then, in all honesty. Yeah, <laughs> and you don't need to write something as good for a game. You just need to do some sort of a layout and write a few piece, a bit, a few bits and pieces here and there to to flesh out the characters and to give them a sort of a unique touch or unique personality to distinguish them from one another. And most of the most of the story is about storyboarding. It's uh, Working like a movie or a comic book, not another written novel. And you're also limited in time. I mean, not every game is something you're going to want to be like Dragon Quest XI, where it's, you know, 90 plus hours. <laughs> I'm sorry, not everyone has the patience to do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I, would, I, I'm, I dare to say, if a game's story were, uh, were at the level of the story from a book or a novel, nobody would play it. Why? Because it's too much text. <laughs> too much, too much Well, that's the problem I have with streaming. There's, there's some of these games that have great writing in it, but 
if I sit there and try to read everything, people just get bored in chat. That's not enough. Yeah. Action. Yeah, that's what I mean. And so, like, when I did my second playthrough of Outer Worlds, it was like, okay, I can sit here and read all of it and really enjoy <laughs> it, but I couldn't do that on stream, and it just... Ugh. Yeah, I get it. Irked me to no end, but it's like, well, gotta do what and, I gotta do. Yeah, and the truth is, uh, a lot of people hate RPGs because they are too much reading. Or, like, you notice from today, <laughs> my stream to, from today... A lot of sitting there, being patient, waiting for, you know, character to get to one place to another. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, when chat's bored because everyone else is lurking, playing other games, or yeah. working at homework, it's like, well, just gonna have to sit there and mm -hmm. let music play. Give yeah, people something. Lots, you know, some games just have a, a sort of a time sinking. Uh, that is... Uh, I don't know, some some find a way to make that time sink fun, and some just don't. For example, I have played an MMO called Black Desert Online. Travel times are insane. You, either you run from one city to another, or from a city to an outpost or somewhere, or you ride on a horse, or or a donkey, or a camel, or whatever. And it's still a very long time that you spend just moving from one place to another. And then you get a quest, and the quest is in some other place, and you have to travel there, and, and it's about a 15-minute travel time. And oh, you bloody can, hell, and 15 minutes? Like... But tonight was what four minutes or five minutes between ones? Even that was bad. Yeah, and this, there's even a uh, out of, a sort of a out of pilot where you set the destination and press a key, and and then you just ride there, and you can leave the computer there. While I leave the computer there while having breakfast or while. Uh, washing dishes or something or cooking and I am just uh, looking uh, uh, sporadically to see if I'm already there or not. Hi, Dr. Cat. Hello. Dr. Cat. Good evening. Good evening. We're just rambling about games we're playing. <laughs> oh, what uh, what games are you all playing? I was doing Final Fantasy 15 on stream. They're up to 15 now. I lost track of the numbers ages ago. <laughs> I got to keep my track record of playing every single one. That's was ever was made. it 11 where they first added the cat girls? Because that's really what I care about. Was the 11? I'm going to think back. I'm Wasn't actually going to look this 11? up here now. And, and I have been streaming the trials. The cards were added. Where were they at? I know Realm Reborn has some, but that's 14. Is, is Trials another uh, role-playing game? Yeah, that's yeah, the, what's a, it, the remake of the original version of it. Yeah, that's the what, original the version one? only came out in Japan. It, it, it was titled Seiken Densetsu Sun, uh, The Legend of the Magic Sword 3. And it was a sequel of uh, Seiken Densetsu Ni, which uh, it, that one did come to the West. As, uh, uh, under the title Secret of Mana. So now they did this remake and, and the localization theme titled it Trials of Mana for the West. And it's a complete rewrite of the combat system, of the leveling system. It's really mm. diff it's a really a different game, but the music, the story, the Everything is well, the music. It brings a lot of nostalgia because it's the exact same composition, but with modern, with but rendered with modern music software. It that no longer sounds like Super Nintendo. It sounds really brilliant and beautiful. Hmm. The combat system you know, it's, is very it's funny. Cool. I played uh, computer role-playing games obsessively in the eighties, but. Um... At some point after I started making them, I stopped playing them so much. Uh, we played through like uh, 
World of Warcraft with my family up until we hit level 60 and then we stopped. But that's that's about the only one. I play just all kinds of other games. Mostly yeah, that was days. me. I binged on the RPGs until about college. And then I, then in, was it 2000, 2001, I kind of started moving into other games like shooters and focusing mm-hmm. more on those because it's like, I need a break. Yeah. Like the past, oh, five years or so, it's been, nope, back into RPGs again. Yeah, well, it's funny, you know, um, uh, Magic Arena, you know, is 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 one of my favorites. I like to play Magic and Paper, but I started uh, uh, three or four years ago making idle games. They wanted to cross, uh, you know, the popular idle game mechanics with the um, the uh, loot chests and upgradable characters um, that you see in Clash Royale, which is another game. I've been hooked on Clash Royale ever since it came out, and I've got you know, my deck all max leveled. I'm trying to get the max, uh, like cosmetic upgrades on all those, on all those cards now, which could take me a couple more years at this rate. But, um, yeah, they wanted to cross those things together. So I did the game balance for them. It became the best, uh, biggest money making idle game on mobile. And, uh, I'm working on a sequel for them now, just like two days ago, actually, uh, the Goldbergs came out based on the ABC TV show. And uh, I worked on that one, and they have me like building some more new new levels for that because now that the players are flooding in, they're gonna they're gonna need lots of content for them. Um, so I I still play the first one I did um, every day, and I make new seasons once a month for it. But um, I don't work on any of the weekend event um, levels they put in. So when I play those, I don't actually know what's going to happen and what all the balance is, so I can enjoy playing them. And they got me kind of hooked it's good on that. to kind of split up the work anyways to keep that fun for yeah well you know people. one one thing i gotta say you know I've, I've made over 50 published games most of them especially really content heavy games you know if you invented the game of chess i imagine you could probably enjoy playing it for decades because it's you know it's it's the way the rules interact and what the other person does but when you make a, a you know a content heavy game, especially but most of the games I've played, you don't play it much after you're done with it. You're like, okay, you know, I, I know what's going on there. It's not interesting to me. It's not fun. Runes of Virtue on the Game Boy. I used to replay Runes of Virtue about once a year, and I haven't in a while now. But I got that itch. I'd like to play it again. For Cadia, I could never get tired of you know user created content and. Um, yeah, these these idle games, the uh, the decisions in the math is fun to me. You know, I, c- I could imagine myself doing more like, you know, action games or computer generated puzzles or something. There's some kinds of games, you you know, that you could enjoy playing your own game. But most of them I don't. There's just been a few. Yeah, I could see some of the roguelite ones being ones developers could enjoy just because each. Yeah, no, I was, I was so happy different. with Runes of Virtue, though, even though Runes of Virtue is content heavy. You know, just the process of playing through it is still fun and, you know, shooting at the monsters and, you know, there were enough puzzles in it that I don't always remember all the puzzles when I go back and play it again after another year. I had to, like, refigure them out. So <laughs> it's, it's like they say, if you know what to do, you're not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, one, one of the things that I got worked into as a specialty yeah. is working out progress curves in games and balancing game economies and, you know, rewards and, and challenges. And uh, you know, I gave a talk at GDC about what I call the fun zone. You know, if you look at your progress curve, it's like how far have you gotten through the game uh, on the vertical axis and how much time have you been playing in, you know, like days and months on the bottom axis. If um, if the, the, the curve is up too high and the game is too hard, people are just going to quit. They're like, oh, this game's too hard. I'm not going to get far. I have to wait too long. It's not fun. But if you, if you let people zoom through the game, then the game's boring because it's too easy. You have, to, you yeah. have to be right in the middle between those extremes where it's challenging, but you feel like, oh, yeah, I'm having to work for this, but I know I'm going to get there. Oh, I had to try this level two or three times. But that's okay. I learned it. I got better at it, and I felt good about beating it with what I learned the first couple times I got killed. You know, you you want yeah. an appropriate level of challenge, so it's so it's fun. I've been having a debate on mobile games with that kind of stuff in regards to, especially the rewards and ones where it's got the RNG mm-hmm. loop of characters and stuff. Yeah, there's one where I've played it now for a little over two years, and the curve did not start very well, but they obviously kind of got it in order eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's so many other ones where the curve is just so bad. 
Yeah. Well, I remember, um, you know, I, uh, I took over, uh, Ravenwood fair, which is the most, uh, most popular game I ever worked on. I took it over for John Romero and Brenda Romero when they moved on to start a new company. And, um, so, you know, when I went to play Frontierville from Zynga, it was, you know, it was more than just casual interest. Ravenwood Fair was inspired by Frontierville, right? John Romero mm-hmm. sat down and played Frontierville for three days, and he spent money to get through more of the content and kind of figure out what they did. And then he sat down and designed Ravenwood Fair. He's like, okay, got it. I see what their ideas were. Here's what I'm going to do, you know? So, um, yeah, you know, understand. And, and it was... Um, uh, like Sid Meier's right hand man on uh, like some of the Civilization games and Alpha Centauri. Um, uh, he's you know a really good designer, and he brought us Doobers, you know the little uh, colorful loot icons that pop out of items in the game with you know a little animated arc and a sound effect. It's like yay loot. Uh, Farmville didn't have that. Frontierville introduced that. It's a very good feature that people enjoy, you know, and everybody does it now. Doobers. Um, but I got to a certain point in Frontierville. I'm like, well, I'm going to play Frontierville like a cheapskate. Like I play every game. How far can I get for free and not spend anything? And, oh yeah, and I got to a cool. point of like, you know, I'm I'm inching through some of the base content, but here's like some cool business or wagon or something you can unlock. It's like obvious. Okay, you can buy these, you know, this special currency for cash and unlock it sooner. I'm like, okay, you know, I can see how much they're charging for that if you just want to spend cash to get it. How long before I get it? You know, and and of course, as I'd expect, as I'm going through the game, it's longer and longer to get each next new thing, right? You know, for a free player. But I look at this thing, I'm like, okay, they want this kind of currency. They want this much of it. I earn it at this rate from, you know, my my ranch or whatever. Six years? Six years? Are you freaking kidding me, Zynga? You know, actually, I forget whether it was six years or 600 years, but that doesn't matter. It was some obscene number. And it's like, no, 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 you're, you're spinning in my face now, you know? Um, you should say, okay, it's six weeks or six months for people that don't pay, and, and you know, people that pay can have in six seconds. Not like, you can never have this, you free-playing cheapskate, you know, jerk. <laughs> um, the amount of, like, the free version, free amount of the premium currency to try to hook you in, they give you just enough, but never enough to really actually make enough progress. No, my, my feeling, my feeling is like the best way, and I call it monetizing impatience, right? The, the, the best situation to put someone in who spends, whether they spend $3 or $5 or maybe even 10 or 20, you want them to feel like, oh, I wanted that thing today. I could have had it next week. So they didn't, they didn't force that $5 out of my pocket. I just gave it to them because I felt impatient and I felt like, hey, $5 isn't that much. You know, I got a little extra in the bank this month. That's fine. But if, if you know, it's it's different if you say to them, yeah, I, I, I spent $5 because they twisted my arm. And they said, I can't I can't have the cool dragon hat unless I give you $5. It's like, well, okay, I did it, you know. And then how, how do all the other kids feel who, you know, uh, who didn't spend the $5 or maybe couldn't afford the $5 this week? It's, you know, um I, I think it's just a much more mercenary attitude. And I don't think, you know, when I saw Zynga and what they were doing when they came out of nowhere to be a huge game company and everybody at GBC was like, ah, oh, there's you know, this rotten Zynga people. Why, why'd they get an award? They don't deserve it, you know. But, um, uh, and, and their founder, Mark Pincus, you know, embodied this ad- attitude. I looked at them, I said, they are strip mining the social network, right? They were spamming yeah, everyone basically. on Facebook, including non-gamers, with your friend got a cow. Want want your friend got a chicken. Your friend got another. You want an egg? Want a cow? It's like, no, I don't play Facebook games. Go away. I'm not a gamer. Like, oh, too bad because we found out if we spam about 800 million of these messages, we get 50 new users, and that's free to us. We don't care about you. <laughs> and and yeah, I'm like, they're gonna burn out their customers. You know, I. To, to me, it's, you know, having a good relationship with players is like sustainable agriculture. We've had customers on Fercadia that are still happy players and customers 20 years later, right? 20 years. Zynga, Zynga, Zynga doesn't build 20-year relationships with its players, you know? The MMO just, I still oh. played the longest was UO or the Realm Online, and both of them are from the 90s. Just it was so much more yeah. sustainable. 
Yeah, I was speaking of people I've known a long time. Cranberry sent me a text. She said uh, she's going to be late to the to the voice chat tonight, and she sends you all her greetings. Aww. Yeah, I ran into her one night in the middle of the night, and she was streaming. I was all excited. But yeah, well, long. you know when it's uh, when it's safe to uh, um, to interact with other humans again. I want to go with her and Fiona out to uh, like Coney Island because I've I've you know been fascinated with Coney Island my whole life. It was like you know took took wild entertainment of human beings to a level it had never reached before when they started those amusement parks there. And there's still some remnant of it there. And I want to go see it. I've never been. My parents were there when they were kids. You know, they, they, they lived in the Northeast, but uh, I've never been. Oh, I've only been there once, but it was quite the experience. Oh, tell me everything. Tell me everything. <laughs> I don't remember all of it because we were drinking most of the time. But Oh, excellent. excellent. We did. They had still some of the old carnival type games where you're more likely to lose than win and we ah, did great great stuff one of the roller coasters we did the ferris wheel yeah um there was a hot dog one that was there for god knows how long it's so you must be, i was gonna ask actually you must be talking about nathan's famous hot dogs am i, I right actually the name yeah yeah so I, I asked my mom you know she and her two sisters got to go when they were little girls to coney island they were in connecticut dad actually grew up in new york but I said, Mom, you know, I, I had seen this uh, black and white documentary on Coney Island. So I tell Warren Spector about it in his office, at, you know, at Origin. And he says, oh, I'll hear, Cat, borrow this book from me. And he's got a book on the history of Coney Island with pictures and stuff. Oh, of course. I read the whole thing and gave it back to him. So I asked my mom, I'm like, Mom, did you go to Coney Island? She's like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, what was it like? Oh, there was so much. Well, what was your favorite thing, Mom? And she says, oh, that's easy. When my sisters and I would go, we would all get really excited that we were going to go to Nathan's hot dog stand and get to drink their delicious orange drink they would sell you. I'm like, that's it? I thought she was going to say a ride or something. The orange drink at Nathan's. <laughs> For me, it was the history of the place. The fact that uh -huh. it's still there after all oh, these yeah. decades. Yeah. It just blows my mind. Because mm -hmm. carnivals just, they don't have the appeal that they used to. Yeah. But even well, they, they shut down the a lot of that. I there there was this there was this um big developer, you know, crooked of course, but uh he mm -hmm. a lot of the redevelopment and changes in New York in the middle of the 20th century were because of him. And uh he was opposed to like amusement parks and and you know uh uh crowds and noise and you know lower class and poor people and he thought that was all bad. So he he got a lot of that shut down. He couldn't force Nathan's hot dogs out, you know. But Nathan fought the guys, like, rezoning stuff and shutting yeah. down amusement parks and stuff. Yeah, they started to reopen some amusements, you know, like, uh, a couple decades later. But it was never, like, the golden days. Never again, you know? Well, this was, like, 17, 18 years ago was the last time I was there. So it's yeah, been... No, in, in, the, in the early oh. 1900s, um, they had the second and third amusement park opened up, right? The, the second mm -hmm. one was two brothers who'd saved up like, you know, $75,000, which was an immense sum at that time, right? And so the crooked political, you know, uh, uh, boss of New York City and mayor, you know, got together with his cronies and they raised money. They got the, the land across the street and they opened up uh, a huge amusement park also. Uh, one of them was Dreamland and the other one was Luna Park. They were, they were rivals. But... Uh, you know, Thomas Edison had not that long ago invented the light bulb. So um, one of these amusement parks, they installed 500,000 light bulbs. And people came to the first night the amusement park was open, and they saw the outdoors lit up as bright as day for the first time anyone had ever seen that in their life. This was an amazing thing. And you know, it was across the street. This was Luna, I think, across the street at Dreamland, not to be outdone by this 500,000 light bulbs. They installed one million light bulbs. Oh, yeah. Got to one up it, Eric. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah, it was amazing. One of them had uh, Mount Vesuvius simulated, of course, erupting, you know, with fake lava every hour on the hour. So across the street, you could see Mount Krakatoa volcano erupting, you know. One of them had a, um, uh, they would simulate a battle from the Boer War, I think it was, uh, against, you know, British soldiers fighting against Zulus. 
And they had a bunch of people in costume as the British people, you know, firing blanks out of their rifles. The Zulus, they found an entire tribe in Africa and made a deal with them and moved them to all to New York. They put them up on the, the amusement park grounds. They lived there. They fed them. They housed them. And every day, multiple times a day, they would go get out their spears and pretend to fight, you know, for, for the, that was their job. So <laughs> they hired an entire tribe. Crazy stuff. Uh, I wish I could have been. But yeah, I'll, I'll go see what's there now for sure. Oh, yeah. It's good to try to at least get some more traveling in now before a lot of these places end up going in the way of the dinosaur. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> I don't expect some of these more historical ones in the States to stick around as long as we hope. Yeah. Well, my, my, my parents, you know, uh, pulled, a, pulled a, a, a nasty little move on my sister and I. Uh, Palisades Amusement Park in New Jersey. Uh, they knew again from like growing up in the North. Oh, that was the biggest amusement park in the United States. The Palisades, everybody, you know, and they had probably been to it as, as kids. I don't, I don't know, but they said, Hey, let's go check out, you know, if Palisades is still there. My sister and I were little kids, you know, on a family car trip to see grandma. We were like biggest amusement park ever. Wow. You know? And so they drive there and it was like the saddest thing in my life. It was still there, but it was closed permanently. But you could look through the fences and see all these things with like tarps draped over them and stuff. It was like the, the corpse of a, a gigantic amusement park and you couldn't go in and have fun. And they're like, oh, why did you show me this? <laughs> That's even uh, one where I still remember the name of it. Yeah, no, I need to watch. I, I picked up in California um, a DVD of nostalgia about this, um, this big amusement park on the Pacific Shore. And I went to this restaurant that's right by where the thing, you know, used to be and it had been shut down. Also, the Sutro Baths, you could see the ruins of them and walk amongst them, which I did, which was like right next to this amusement park. It was a huge public, you know, diving and swimming facility and they had dance floors and they had rows of bleachers if you just wanted to sit and watch other people swim. You know, it was, it was a huge facility. But uh yeah, I, I got a couple nostalgia DVDs on those I have to watch and, and you know, learn about the history of fun. So, it's my research. We had something else that I posted. Let me just check Discord here. Oh, yeah. One of the articles that came out recently had Microsoft's big uh, milestone that I thought was rather significant. The uh, Xbox Game Pass that everyone was a little skeptical of at first hit over 10 million people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Certainly crushed uh, Stadia, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I was interested in Stadia a bit because it was Google. Google has interviewed me for jobs like four or five times now. And they, they always say, oh, you know, either the, the position we were interviewing you for has been closed, you know, before, before we made you an offer. So I guess we stopped talking to you about it now. Uh, or um, one time they said, oh, the only openings in that advanced research group are two levels too low for you. And uh, so I told the recruiter, you know, I, I could I could consider just joining at that and they could promote me later. And she said, oh, yeah, I tried talking to them about it. They said, you know, the pay would be an insult. I'm like, what is the pay at, you know, at L5? And she told me, I'm like, yeah, most, most places don't pay like that for anything, but whatever. Um, and then she said also, which is fair, she said, well, you know, if if you and L7 were there with these other L5s, when, a, when an opening in that group opened up for an L6 or an L7, and they wanted to go for the promotion, they wouldn't have a fair shot at it because they'd be up against you. I'm like, okay, I, I can see the point there, you know. But uh, no, if if I were if I were running Google and like an exceptional candidate comes along, it's like, man, we gotta have this guy at Google. Let's create a position that'll fit in somewhere, and you know, put it in. It. They're, they're, um, the guy that called me actually from Austin said, oh, we've, we've set up a new advanced recruiting group because we found we're good at recruiting, you know, like young people right out of college or early in their careers, but we're bad at recruiting more, you know, senior experienced talent. So our group was formed to do that. So let me just chat with you. And then I'm going to look around different grops and see if I can find anything that might be to your taste. And okay, cool. Yeah. And that didn't lead anywhere either. So oh. But yeah, uh, Stadia was, you know, was winding up around what the last time they, they called me and said, hey, we want to check on you again, see if we want to try and interview you for something, whatever. And um, 
they said, oh, you know, stadium might be a match, but you'd have to move to California. Like, no, I'm not moving from from Austin. I, I call it, no, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll consider stadia, you know, if, if something's. Uh, but then I talked to Steve Moretzky about it, you know, uh, former Infocom mm. guy. He's in my same consulting group, Mobile Game Doctor, and uh, one of the funniest guys in the game industry. He had been consulting for Stadia. So I said, hey, Steve, what's the deal on Stadia? He's like, oh, it's going to fail. <laughs> I said, oh, it's, uh, is, is the technology not good enough or the, the concept? He said, no, actually, it's pretty decent quality. It's fine. He said, the way they're, the way they're running the um, – the, the the thing is is just so messed up and wrong. They're they're gonna fail. Okay. <laughs> oh, he nailed it right on the head. Yeah. No. I uh, you know I I told the recruiter briefly. Not that she necessarily passed it along or that it matters. You know, if you're gonna sell this thing at all, the whole idea that you're playing on the cloud rather than on your home PC, forget it. Don't put that in your marketing at all. A. Nobody cares. B. To my mind, that's like. You know, 99 times out of 100, that's just saying the gaming quality will range from inferior to best case, just as good as you have now on your home system, but not better, right? That 1% of the time is when, oh, my my gaming PC is 11 years old, and here's this game that came out yesterday, and just like old-time Origin, they insist on the fastest CPUs and the latest 3D cards, and my system runs it at like two frames a second. God damn it. Oh, but I could play on Stadia 30 frames a second because they got butch hardware. It's like, you know, the best thing to do if you're a hardcore gamer is just get a new computer every three or four years if they're going to keep pulling that crap. But most most games don't sure. require booting at hardware. But when you play online, you got you got network latency and... and uh, um, uh, uh, packet loss and, and brief bursts of extra lag and, and, and bullshit. So you don't sell that. But they had one feature that I thought actually makes the service work something. And that's like the zero loading time and the zero install time, right? You say, oh, here's this latest AAA game. I want to play it. I could say, start downloading it and, and you know, an hour and a half later or tomorrow morning or, oh, I got the most expensive thing Time Warner would sell me. I could be playing it in 12 minutes, whatever, you know. Um, no, you go on Stadia, it's like, oh, they already installed all, you know, four and a half gigs on that server machine. You just click play and they're like, okay, I'm on the title screen, you know, hit start. Uh, now I see a castle. I like that, that could appeal to people not waiting to try out games, even if they're massive games. That's new. That's good. But you should, you should sell Stadia like it's only that and none of this other crap that, you know, people either don't care about or, or might actually make the games a little worse. I think there ins- it was kind of sad almost I thought that Stadia basically inspired the whole Nvidia cloud thing where it's like yeah, you're basically renting a steam machine mm-hmm. then it's yeah, already people, installed people had, and- tried, people had tried cloud gaming services as far back as like 10 years ago or more I forget when it started well you PlayStation know. Now was around well before both of these other two and yeah it wasn't perfect but it definitely worked well but they focused on a lot of older games where that latency is going to mm-hmm. be minimized and yeah, well, you know, it, it really that. depends on style of game. If you're playing like a, um, a first-person shooter, you know, that's kind of worst case. You know, if, if you're playing chat, who the fuck cares? You know, <laughs> it's fine. But uh, um, The thing is, like, PlayStation kept that reality in mind of, hey, this is the reality of the situation with latency, most people's internet connection in most of the country, things like that. These other ones are like, no, we're just going to assume best case. And it's like, no, you can't do that. Yeah. You have to live in reality. I remember, I remember reading some of Carmack's uh, posts about how he worked out how to reduce, you know, uh, like the, the complete loop through the code from like you like, you know, pushed a uh, pushed a movement button or a fire button to like, you know, round trip to other computer and back to you and, and the frame rendering sequence. And like he worked out how to sequence things better to shave uh, milliseconds off when you did something to to when you got the the visual and audio feedback in the game of it happening i'm like wow that that was very well done i like read every detail he did he said okay yeah he's really on top of this and he's doing it right you know but he's he's a sharp guy uh, a lot of a lot of people don't know to op, don't know how to optimize to the extent he does i deal with enough product development in a different industry than video games but it's ugh, makes me want to pound my head on the desk sometimes when i see some yeah 
Yeah, no, I got I got a little frustrated last week. You know, I'd been talking to the Knox Arceus guys on and off for like two or three years about, hey, you should put a really good quality pulse width modulation sound effect in the boot up screen for Knox Arceus, and I can tell you how to do it. I told one programmer in detail exactly how to do it, but A, he, he didn't seem to be getting everything I said. B, he wanted to do some other stuff and experiment like, you know, that might not work. You should probably just do literally exactly what I said first, get it working well, and then try and do those improvements that you think are possible and that might be possible, you know. But then he left the project before he did that. And then the guy I was talking to, it's like, well, I don't know sound too well. I'm not that good at 65. Or I'm like, maybe I could find a few hours and just recode for you what I did. But I never got around to it. And then they found this guy who did this brilliant, pulse width modulation sound and video using some extra hardware, like, you know, 512K of extra RAM. But he did this brilliant demo at the Kansas Apple Fest. I'm like, yes, if you go with that guy, he he will get you as good audio quality as I did. He's doing it the same way. You know, I read his notes. And then they, they like, they picked a bad drum sound to put in. <laughs> no, no, you should, you should have done voice, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, now they've got a bad sound effect on the boot up, which they worked really hard on. And uh, no, redo it. He's like, oh, we're about to go into file testing. I take a day or two here. I'll, I'll, I'll like record a word. I'll say it two different ways. I emailed it to him. He's probably going to ignore it. But uh, I tried. I tried. It reminds me, I need to reach out the flying weld hugs. Find yeah, no, let's add my, my, uh, my beautiful sounding digitized sound on the Apple II Plus, by the way. Uh, I made it with the intention that Greg Malone could try and use it in uh, in Windwalker. But he was late getting that out and broke, and the Apple game market was dying, and it ended up not selling any and not making any money anyway. But he didn't want to spend a day or even like two or three hours putting it in. I got all the code working for him, and then he was like, you know, so where's the file I just put in? It's like he expected me to also make up a sound effect, figure out how to hook it in his game, and throw it on the disc for him. And my job was just to make a Commodore 64 version, right? I wasn't being paid a penny to do anything for the Apple version. But I told him on Friday, I thought, okay, this this sounds pretty good for an Apple, but there's three problems with it that make me feel like it's not good enough quality for a for a published game in, you know, by my standards. If I could solve all three of them over the weekend, boy, that would be cool. So I told Greg, I said, you know, if I solve all these and give you the sound routine, you know, you should owe me one cheeseburger. He said, okay. He said, okay, he never bought me the cheeseburger. Greg Malone owes me one cheeseburger to this day. Uh, Soft Disk, magazine on disc, if any of you heard of it. You know, John Romero and the id guys, you know, used to work there making little games for them. Um, I sold them this uh, this thing to put on their Apple Disk magazine where you hear me saying the word meow with remarkable, you know, clarity for an Apple II speaker. And they paid me $75 for it. So... I, I made my money off my hard work. <laughs> I wonder if that file is still around somewhere. I would love to hear it again. If you want to join the Ultimate Dragons, you can do so at udic.org, where at you can choose your very own dragon name. You can also find the Ultimate Dragons on Facebook. We have a Facebook group there. And you can follow at Ultimate Dragons on Twitter or join them on Discord. And if you're feeling really old school, you can even fire up a Telnet client and check out the Wearmount. Hit up the show notes for links to all of these. If you want to participate more directly in the podcast, you can send us an email. Or if you're feeling a little bit braver, leave us a voice message in one of three places, the podcast website, our Facebook page, or on anchor.fm. And you're also welcome to join us on our Discord server to chat with us, to lurk, or even contribute to podcast recordings when they happen. And again, links in the show notes. If you'd like to support Spam, Spam, Spam Humbug, you can do so at patreon.com slash ultimacodex, where for as little as a dollar a month, you can get access to episodes the day before they go live to the general public. You'll also get access to behind-the-scenes audio when we have some to share, and possibly other interesting content. But we also welcome your moral support. You can like the Ultima series on Facebook, follow at Ultima Codex on Twitter, or leave the podcast a review on iTunes. And you're also welcome to share our episodes with your friends and social media circles. Spam 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 Humbug is a production of the Ultima Codex. You can find show notes online at spam 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 humbug.com. Thank you for listening, and until next time, be virtuous. Be virtuous.